Good afternoon. And I'm Emma Oxford, Director of Community Relations here since uh, February, so this is just my second Books and Coffee talk. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming today, and thanks also to the Community Fund of Bronxville, Eastchester, and Tuckahoe for supporting this program, and uh, to our other regular supporters, the Friends of Concordia. At the end of the talk today, we'll hold our traditional raffle for a Wamrath's book certificate. So if you haven't already filled out a green card with your contact information, please uh, raise your hand and I'll pass some around during the talk. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pass a few around uh, in a little bit. Hello. Yes. And uh, that reminds me to ask you all to please switch off your cell phones. <laughs> I'm very pleased to welcome back to Concordia today's speaker. David Fuller is a very good friend of Books and Coffee, and today he's making his fifth presentation. So he's well known to many of you, and David, your reviews are eagerly anticipated here. David practices law at the firm of Bosworth, Gray, and Fuller in Bronxville, and he is also a village justice in Tuckahoe. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School, and he has a passion for American history. Today, David has chosen to review David Halberstam's magnificent history of the Korean War, The Coldest Winter, America and the Korean War. Halberstam considered this to be his finest book, but as some of you may know, sadly, it was his last work because he died in a car accident very soon after it was completed at the age of 73. David, thank you for sharing your assessment of the coldest winter with us today. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to hear about this really wonderful book by David Halberstam, The Coldest Winter, all over 600 pages of it. And oftentimes about these historical uh, topics, we haven't lived through it. We had one on the uh, Spanish-American War, War of 1812, but this one is one that I imagine most of us have, have lived through. Uh, I certainly remember it, 1950, almost 60 years ago when you think of it. But uh, David Halberstam uh, decided on this one because he had become very much interested in the Korean War when he was covering the Vietnam War because he saw a lot of parallels there. And there are a number of parallels. Of course, there are also some very large differences. The Vietnam War was, as you know, a very long war, whereas uh, the, the uh, Korean War was only three years. And the v Vietnam War had a lot of participation of of civilians, a lot of civilians making decisions. And the, the uh, Korean War was essentially decided by the military. I guess one other difference that um, is noted is that in the Korean War, it was all people who, in command, who had been born in the 19th century. And it's funny that just a uh, decade later, really, in the 1960s, these were all people who had been born in the 20th century and we're a lot younger. It was the idea of the new frontier and the new people who were doing that one. Uh, David Halberstam received a Pulitzer Prize for his coverage of the uh, uh, Vietnam War, and he uh, w was um, uh, very much recognized for a book called The Best and the Brightest. Remember The Best and the Brightest? It was a wonderful book about the people who were in charge of the Vietnam War, and the... the um, principle that came out of that book was that the people who are the brightest aren't necessarily the ones with the best judgment. And that's probably a good lesson for, for a lot of people. But the, 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 um, the one about, as was said by Emma, the, the one that, about Korea was one where he, he said, this is a book that I really want to, to, um, to show the comparisons, which he does. But as was said, he, he was sadly, uh, he sadly died it was a tragic um, uh, accident. It was also one where he was on his way to interview for his next book. He was going to write a book about football, and we missed that one. He um, did speak here. I don't know if any of you saw him. He spoke here uh, in this room uh, for, for the Bronxville Conservancy, the, the uh, Brennan Gill Lectures. But um, 
Uh, he um, have had a number of illustrations in his book, except they're all maps. That's all he has in this book. There are no, no pictures of anybody, except on the outside. He shows it's really just all snow on the outside, just showing how these troops had to really um, suffer during that winter of 50 and 51. So speaking of maps, Concordia pro provided a map for us here. And this is really um, very helpful. Let's get the right machine here. Because we can see the cast of character, we can see the cast of characters here. This is a kind of a walker here they've given me, and um, if I can um, just show a few things here uh, to get started, I'd like to talk about the areas we're dealing with, and also the character, the cast of characters involved. So up here, see if I can run this thing properly. I'm supposed to. There's, there's supposed to be a little um, a laser beam. Now, and once I see it, I'll know that I'm doing it right here. It's on the which it's, is a, it's the trigger on the back. Which, 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 which is the thing? Here? This one right here. There, here it is. Thank you. Very well. There it is. All right. So up here, uh, does anyone know what this is up here? Uh, this part that comes at the border? That's actually Sib that's Siberia. You can't what? You can't hear me. Okay, let me get it better here. Is this, does it still work? Yeah, it does work so I can hold this. Okay, that's good. All right, up here is Siberia. So you see that um, down here, Korea abuts Siberia. And then, of course, this is Manchuria, part of China. But I want to talk about Siberia, uh, Vladivostok, that area, because that's what was the one in charge there was Stalin, who had three more years to live in 1950. And he was the one that North Korea really had to talk to and get permission from before he was able before they were able to launch the surprise attack against South South Korea. He promised the um, North Koreans that they would have air cover, but then he reneged at the last minute. He was afraid of getting into a war with with um, the United States directly. He'd rather do it indirectly. And then over here with, with um, Manchuria, of course, we know the person there was Mao. And Mao was flush with victory. He had just, uh, the year before, in, um, he had sent the uh, nationalists over to Formosa in 1949, and his troops were, were really very, very battle ready. And he did promise troops, but North Korea didn't think they really needed, at least the leader there, Kim Il-sung, he didn't think they needed any help because he thought, first of all, they were very well prepared, and also that once they came to South Korea, that the South Korea, Koreans would welcome them so they could have a unified uh, Unified Korea. So this is um, coming down here. Here's the capital, and here's and then there's the um, the 38th parallel. And the 38th parallel is what was decided after the Second World War in '45. The uh, victorious power said, "Well, just a uh, convenient place to do it." Uh, and not only that, when you see it here, how it's relatively narrow there. But look at the boundary over here. You see how, how, when you get up north in Korea, how, how long the boundary is between China and Russia. So that here's where they came across, but the Korea itself had been a colony of Japan since 1910. And so Korea really was just getting its independence in 1945 from Japanese rule. And you had the north, which is, of course, very communist, and the south, with, uh, does anyone remember the name of the person? You, you know his name. Remember in the South? His name was Sigmund Rhee. Remember the name Sigmund Rhee? And he was the oldest of the ones in charge. He was 75. He had been educated in the United States, Princeton, New Woodrow Wilson. And uh, so he, he also wanted to have Korea be unified, but uh, the United States wasn't gonna, uh, wouldn't have, I mean, they said, we'll just keep it at the 38th parallel. He, he'd like to have had it happen, but it wasn't going to happen. Uh, then down here, of course, we all know what that is. That's Japan, I mean, which is the southern part of Japan. So you can see how close uh, Japan is, is to Korea. Well, um, in Japan, it was occupied, of course, uh, still in 1950, and the one in charge was Douglas MacArthur. And he, um, uh, of course, was legendary. He, he was the one that had the high, some of the highest one of the highest averages ever gotten at, at West Point. I guess his only um, failing, he was certainly one who had no uh, uh, self-doubt, but his real failing, by his own measure anyway, was he was not, he did not excel in sports. He was not a, a, 
uh, what you call really an athlete, but he was certainly very, very bright and had that record in the First World War and then in the, um, in the interim was the, the uh, top general and then during the Second World War the I shall return and he was doing, a, everyone thinks, a credible job in, in uh, Japan getting everyone back together. He was 70 years old and he was the one that was later going to be in charge of all the troops. Now in the United States, Truman, right, Truman administration, people were blaming Truman for having that administration having lost China. So he lost China uh, to, to, to the communists and he had a Secretary of State, Dean Acheson. And Dean Acheson was one, if, I don't know if you remember how, he, he uh, a very capable man, but he had a lot of enemies. A lot of people didn't like him very much. And, uh, but he was certainly uh, one who, who um, was making important decisions here. Uh, one bad decision he was said to have made was that in January, January of 1950, that he gave a talk before the National Press Club, and he had said that um, there was a protected area, that the U.S. was going to protect a certain area here in, in Asia, but he left out South Korea. And some people felt that that, that mistake was a signal that uh, started the war. But it seems very clear from this book that no matter what had happened, no matter what he would have said, North Korea wanted to come and invade South Korea because Sim Il-sung just wanted to uh, have a united Korea and he wanted to have a united communist Korea. He was, he was the only really relatively young person. He was still in his 30s. In fact, his son, it's his son in Korea now, North Korea, who's still causing trouble. So it's, um, it, it was a dynasty there that just wanted to have a, a communist state. Well, the big date, does anyone remember the big date? It's um, June 25, June 25, 1950. It was Saturday for us. It was over there. It was Sunday. And the uh, North Koreans just came by. and It was, it was a total... Uh, really a total surprise. In other words, no one really, really knew that it was going to happen uh, on the other side. Uh, the, no one was ready. Uh, there, were, there were a few indications that there were, there were railroad tracks going north and south, and when the uh, division had taken place in 45, the, uh, they, they, the tracks had been cut, and so there wasn't any, any commerce between the two countries, but those tracks had been repaired, and maybe someone should have thought, well, why did the North Koreans... Uh, repair those tracks. Well, actually, it was to get arms down, but maybe that was maybe one signal. The other was that they repaired some bridges, too, so that the Russian tanks could go over these bridges from north to south. But uh, there was never any question that once they came over that the United States wanted, wanted to, uh, wanted to, to um, reject or, and, and repulse the attack. The um, fortunate part here was that we talked about China Having, um, uh, having won against Chiang Kai-shek, mainland China. And the UN, under the US uh, influence there, did not want the representation of China in the Security Council in the UN. And so when the, they had Chiang Kai-shek's representative instead, despite that uh, victory. And so Russia was very, Stalin, Russia was very angry about that, and so they withdrew, they boycotted the Security Council, and because of that, the UN could get through a resolution that next week, so say Monday or Tuesday, saying that the UN would also fight this aggression. So it was a UN force, but there was never any declaration of war by Congress. It was simply called a police action when Truman said, we're going to, to um, repel the, this invasion. Well, they sent over the Eighth Army from, from the Eighth Army was in, in Japan, and uh, unfortunately for, for this uh, exercise, it was it was uh, a very unprepared army. I mean, it was in 1945, of course, uh, it had been the, the, the leading army in the world, but uh, there had been a big debo demobilization, and the, the uh, when you went to Japan, that was really a very soft assignment. You could get things cheap. You could people had uh, a lot of help, they, they, could, they had girlfriends, they, they had easy um, assignments, there was not a whole lot of practice going on, and they had leftover weapons from World War II, uh, and so when they came, it was really um, uh, in doubt at first when the UN forces came that they could even hold on, to the, uh, hold on to the peninsula. See down here, they came over the border, they took Seoul, just that's of course the capital of, of South Korea, they took that very quickly. They kept coming down, and really they took everything here except for this little part here, which, and when I say the, the phrase, you'll remember, the Pusan perimeter. Remember that, Pusan perimeter? Some of you, probably some of you fought over there, but anyway, we'll hear about that maybe during the question period, but 
there's about 50 miles this way, 50 miles that way. And, um, uh, but they sent over a commander who was really very good. His name was, last name was Walker. It was um, Walton Walker, head of the 8th Army. And he had fought under Patton. He was very good, but he was dealing with, 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 with very, very um, difficult um, circumstances because, first of all, uh, they had uh, bazookas that were supposed to go against the tanks, and, and they uh, were bouncing off the tanks. They, they, they should have been a, a better, um, a, better uh, a new, new form of bazooka, and they did get it later in the summer of 1950. But they, and they had uh, troops that were not well prepared, and so that there, it was really um, a very tough July, let's put it that way, July of 1950. Well, then they, they, they came down and, and they were able to, the uh, UN forces were able to hold the, the, the perimeter there. And uh, gradually, they were, they were able to, um, to at least make some headway going north. Now, the one in charge, as I said, was MacArthur. MacArthur had a plan. And uh, you've all heard about this plan, I'm sure. But he said, what we have to do is to not just depend on pushing them back, but we want to get behind their lines. So he, went, he said, we have to go over here. The port of Seoul is called Inchon. That's the port. And he said, we have to um, land there, and then we'll be behind their lines and be able to get them from the bottom and also from the top. But the problem was that MacArthur was the only one that really thought that would work. Uh, and he, he went out on a limb, but they said, how can you do it? They said, first of all, the harbor there at uh, Inchon might be mined. They said, secondly, the, the um, uh, currents are very bad there. Uh, there, there are sea walls that, that are 30 feet high. And uh, the only thing that could be responded to that was, MacArthur said two things. One is, he said, every month, uh, the, the um, tides, the, high, the high, tides went very high, went up 30 feet so they could be level, only one, once a month. And also, he said it was such an improbable place Everyone thought it was such a, a difficult assignment that that would mean that they'd have surprise. And of course, you always want surprise, just the way the North Koreans wanted surprise going over the border. Well, the, the um, Americans and UN forces wanted surprise against the North, um, North Koreans. So uh, he said it, was, it's so, it would seem so preposterous that we would do something like that, that that means they won't be prepared for it. And that sounds a little strange, but it really did work. And when uh, in, you see there, September 15th, which is the one time when the tides, just before daybreak, the tides were high enough so they could come ashore, and they, it was a complete success. It was one of the most, it was probably the best thing that MacArthur ever did. And, and people were just uh, flabbergasted that it would really work. They had some great help there. For instance, they had the 1st Marine Division, which had a great reputation for the First World War, or Second World War, and they, uh, also had the help uh, of this uh, this Eighth Army. What's that? Oh, it's still okay. Thank you. I would thank, keep reminding me. I try to keep it here. But anyway, so they went through. They, they uh, retook Seoul, and they were. And then the um, North Koreans were pushed up from below the 38th parallel all the way up into North Korea. Now, some people said they should have stopped there. I mean, well, why why uh, why go further? But uh, MacArthur felt that. Um, if you're going to start the war, you want to finish it. You want to take over all of Korea. And he met with Truman on Wake Island on October the 15th. And Truman said, well, if you, if you go all the way up to, to the border there and, and take by the, it's the Yalu River, you'll see it up there, the, the Yalu River. If you uh, take all of Korea, they wanted to take all of Korea. Now, we'll take all of Korea. We'll, um, do you think that uh, the, the, the Chinese will come in? There's the, the Yalu River along there. And MacArthur felt he really knew the Oriental mind. He said the Chinese, they wouldn't come in. And he had a, 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 a deputy by the name of Ned Almond, who was a general. And whenever he referred to the Chinese, he would call them the laundrymen. He, he felt these, these people just didn't know how to fight. But that was really, and even then, or especially now, that seems like a very strange thing to say. Not only is it a prejudiced thing to say, but it was you have to know your enemy. And these Chinese um, soldiers were very good. I mean, they had been the ones that had, had won against Chiang Kai-shek the year before, and we had fortified Chiang Kai-shek and given him enormous uh, supplies and all. And so for them to have done that, that was a big accomplishment. So it really wasn't wise to underestimate the Chinese. And, and what was even more difficult was, or more um, catastrophic was to have thought they weren't going to come in. Because now we know, of course, then it's true, they didn't know for sure. But now we know that there was no question that, that the Chinese were going to come in. They, they did not want to have the Americans up there 
and not have any buffer. Well, with North Korea, at least they had a buffer there, but just to have the Americans over on one side and the Chinese on the other, and you know that in 1950, uh, it was, there wasn't much, I mean, we didn't even recognize Red China, and uh, there was a lot of hostility, the McCarthyism was at its peak, and so there was no way that, um, that with our feeling towards China and China's feeling towards us, that they were going to let that, that stand. But they did have another, they did have a strategy, the Chinese, and that was, they, said they did not come down right away. They let the North Koreans go up there, and now we're talking about, say, um, uh, September, October. They let the, the, uh, the UN forces come up there, and, and, and it was seemed as though it was so, such easy going, which may, maybe it was easy going, and that may have, maybe should have alerted someone that something's wrong here. Why is it so easy to go all the way up to the top here? And in fact, in November, the um, seventh uh, Army Division, 7th Army um, Division was able to, to get to the Yalu River. And, um, and, and MacArthur thought, this is, this is really easy. We, we can really win this. And here's another phrase. Remember this one, home by Christmas? Does that ring a bell? Home, home by Christmas. Right? We're going to get home by Christmas because it was by um, Thanksgiving time. We'd reached the, um, the Yalu River. These are all the UN forces. And... Um, it was always under the assumption that the Chinese weren't going to come. And when they, there were a few Chinese they found, they interrogated them, but they said, um, they said, no, these are probably just a few, nothing uh, that we can't take care of. The Chinese uh, were very well prepared in several ways. One is that they, they wore these white parkas. These white parkas were not only warm, but it was all snow up there. As I say, it was the coldest winter. Sometimes it got down, down to 40 below zero. And... Um, when they heard a plane, a reconnaissance plane come from, from the other side, they would just freeze. And, 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 you, and there would be these hordes of, of Chinese that you couldn't see because they were white and they blended in with the snow. And so even though they'd crossed the Yalu River at some points, it wasn't known that they were, they were, um, they were over there. Well, it turned out that uh, MacArthur decided to divide his forces. He had a good part of the 8th Army on the, on the left-hand side, and then he had the um, be over over on over on this side, good good part over here. And then on the the right hand side, the eastern side, uh, he had one of his generals, Ned Almond, take over something called the Tenth Corps. And the Tenth Corps was made up of two divisions: the First Marine Division and the Second and the Seventh Army Division. All right, so here we here they're coming. It's going to be a a, a pincher movement here. They're going to um, they're going to uh, let me just get this here. Where is it? Oh, I'm having so. They're right. So the Eighth Army would come up here, and the um, uh, the Tenth Corps would come up this way. And there's something called here a change in reservoir. And actually, that has to be the, what they call the chosen reservoir. That's the only way because it's right in that area. They have a different name for it there, but they call it the chosen reservoir. In fact, uh, in the book, sometimes it's referred to as the uh, uh, chosen frozen because they were really uh, uh, so so, um, so cold up there. But so you had the 1st Marine Division over here, and the, the idea was to have the 10th Corps come this way, and the, the 8th Army come this way, and then they would meet, and they would, they would secure that entire, entire border. That was the idea, without any interference from the Chinese. Well, there was one general, he was a Marine general, his name was O.P. Smith, who said, I want to prepare, he's the only one, I want to prepare for the eventuality that MacArthur's wrong. And people didn't want to question MacArthur. In fact, even, even um, O.P. Smith said, uh, you know, he said, I, think he's, I really think he's wrong, but you know, everyone thought he was wrong with the Inchon invasion and landing, and he wasn't wrong. Maybe he'll pull it off. And then later he said, but he didn't pull it off. Because the Americans and U.N. forces arrived on November the 21st, and then on November 25th is when all the... The, the massive troops, I mean 400,000 Chinese troops, uh, came down on both sides there. But O.P. Smith was the one, the only one who came out uh, of this with, with his, um, his first Marine Division intact. Uh, the other, the others all just fled really. I mean, the, the whole, everything broke up on the, on the left side. The 8th Army, it was, they called it the gauntlet. They just went down, came down because they were these, these overwhelming forces. Uh, of Chinese just came, and, and, and even though the Chinese didn't have a lot of artillery, they had no air cover, the Americans and the um, UN forces just weren't expecting them, so they were completely unprepared. So they came all the way down, they were pushed all the way down to uh, 
lower than Seoul. You see Seoul there, but, but um, they never obviously they never got back to the um, to the to the uh, Pusan Pusan perimeter. They got the Han River around here, a place called there's Wanju down here. Wanju is a little bulge down there, and um, so you can imagine if they were up here. It's just an enormous uh, retreat that they had, and it was very disorderly. There, there was one um, instance. Uh, there are a number of them. They're very interesting. We can't go through all of them because you know you, uh, you have to read the book, and what's more, we don't have that kind of time. But uh, there was one instance that I just wanted to mention that was just kind of emblematic of what went on down there, and that is that they had about four enlisted men who were carrying a, a wounded man, and they ran into a lieutenant, and they were walked. They were walking together. Sometimes people tried to get on tanks, but then they were picked off by. By the Chinese, so you really should walk, and you shouldn't have walked on roads. Some were walking on roads because the Chinese were getting after them then. But everything there was just a, a real um, a chaos coming down. But after they were walking and kind of held, slowed down a little bit by this wounded man, um, the, the lieutenant said, "Look, we're going to have to let, let this wounded man here. Let a helicopter pick him up tomorrow, and then and then we'll be able to go a lot faster." And the, the enlisted men said to the lieutenant, listen, I mean, of course, he had rank, but nonetheless, it wasn't any kind of a special unit, so, but the enlisted, the, the, um, enlisted men said, you're just leaving him here to die. I mean, that, there's no helicopter that's going to pick him up. And the lieutenant insisted, and uh, they, so they just split company. The lieutenant went his way, and then the, the uh, enlisted men with their wounded men went the other way. And as they went further, uh, some Chinese shot at them and, and in, injured another enlisted man, so they had two to carry. And they, but they finally made it down. It, it sounded miraculous, really. They made it down. You may remember this um, during these times. They, they had a lot of pictures in the, uh, the Life magazine and also uh, the Saturday Evening Post. And I remember the Saturday Evening Post, there, there was um, one article, God Saved My Life in Korea. There was a soldier that had that story to tell. Well, th this was that kind of thing where people were, were just in, in extremists here. But the, the four... Soldiers who then, actually three, carrying two wounded men, they finally were picked up by a, a jeep and brought back, to, and, and they were saved. They took them all to recuperate, but, but they, they made it. But the lieutenant was then captured and died in a, in a, uh, a prison camp, so you never know what's going to happen. But that's on that side. But the most important thing that happened after what Halberstam called the greatest, um, so he called this the greatest military ambush in U.S. history. This, this, uh, it was really remarkable when you think of how, how humiliating and morale busting that was. But the only one bright light was on the, on the east side, and that was O.P. Smith. And this is a story, I mean, if you've ever read anything about the, the uh, Marines or about, about battles, this is the story of all stories. I mean, it's, it's one of the most remarkable stories you can imagine. And that is how O.P. Smith said, look, if MacArthur's wrong, which no one else really wanted to say, um, we first of all, we have to go slowly. And according to Halberstam, um, when he was getting orders to go very fast, and uh, he was going more slowly, if he hadn't been a Marine major, he, he would, would have been relieved, really, because he was really slowing down when he kept being told to speed up. He said, we don't want to speed up. Well, the, the, he said, as we're going up, we're going to leave supplies along the way so that when we come back, we'll be able to get those supplies. He said, coming back? You're not coming back. Yes, you, we're, we're coming. I, MacArthur, I think, is wrong. And so they, they were moving up there. It was along this um, chosen reservoir here. The, um, let's see if I got it here. Oh, here it is. Right along here. So they want they want to come down to Hung Hung Nam. That was the, that was their that was where they could get out because there was a port. And so they were coming up here, and they came up to about this point here. It didn't quite make it to the Yalu River, and that was when the Chinese had come. Well. Uh, O.P. Smith had asked for something else. He said, in addition, I want to have an airstrip up here. Uh, I want to be able to have airplanes take off right nearby. So that he took him uh, a lot of pushing to get that, but he got that. Because he said he wanted to have the wounded men go back, be able to be flown back to Japan. And, and he said, well, I mean, there aren't going to be any. I mean, we're going to win. No, I want to be just sure. So that with his um, division, division being 12,000 12, uh, Marines, he... Um, wanted to have it all arranged for that kind of protection. And also, with his regiments in the division, he, he wanted them pretty close together. And, and, and the um, uh, headquarters in, in, in Tokyo said, no, we want them further apart, but he was able to get, that, get them at least somewhat closer together. 
There, there was another um, thing that he wanted, and that was there was a pass right, right as you get up to the chosen reservoir. There's a little pass called Funchillen Pass, very narrow pass that if you um, were to have a false move, you just go down a cast, and that's all. And there was one bridge on there where you could bring soldiers up, and the bridge was still intact, even though the, the uh, Marines were marching up there. And, and uh, Smith said to himself, or said to his, his aides, you know, I wonder why they haven't blown up that bridge, because the Chinese, I mean, if they're up there, even the North Koreans, they should blow up that bridge, because if they, if they blow it up, then we won't be able to go up there. It's the only way we could get up there. But he said, I think I know what's happening. I think they want us to use that bridge. And I think they want us to get up there because then they're going to blow up the bridge and then we're not going to be able to get back. And that's exactly what happened. But he made provision for that. He said, I, I, I want to have it ordered some kind of a treadway portable bridge so that the, 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 um, the, air, the, the, the um, air Force can give us a new bridge very quickly. And, and so they got across the, the uh, Funchillen Pass there. They had their... their full Marine division up there, and all of a sudden they were surrounded by, by um, 60,000 60, Chinese, 60,000 to, to, to 12,000. And that's exactly what he was afraid of, and that's what it was, the numbers of the Chinese, because the, the Mao kept saying, you know, we don't, uh, we don't really care about, I mean, he didn't say it quite this way, but it's what it was, is that we have people to spare. And we, we, could, we could even, someone said, how about the A-bomb? We, we don't care, we, 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 we have people to spare. And so they had 60,000 Chinese against, against um, uh, 12,000 Marines. And this is the story of the, uh, of the, um, the two-week two two -week battle uh, up at the, um, the Chosen Reservoir, the Frozen Chosen. The, the, um, it was also called a breakout. No one likes to say, especially Marines don't like to say retreat. They called it a breakout. So they were surrounded by these Chinese. And, and um, Omar Bradley, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he said, I don't think they're going to make it out of there. I mean, when you have 60,000 soldiers, well-trained soldiers, against 12,000, you're just not going to make it out. Well, what happened is that the plan of O.P. Smith did work, and um, the, the, uh, the Marines uh, fought, of course, very hard. They, they had, I think they had a loss. They lost about 500, 561 Marines were, were lost during those two weeks. And then they had a couple hundred missing. Um, uh, under under 3,000, under 3,000 were wounded, and then there were over 3,000 had non non um, battle wounds, mostly frostbite because it was cold up there. They had, you'd have tanks up there, and the tanks, uh, the, the the treads of the tanks would just freeze to the ground. You it had hard to get the tanks going. It was so cold up there. Well, the thing that really tells the story, so that the when the um, uh, Marines got down to Got, got down. They came here and they got down to Hung Nam, where they were safe down here. The, um, the, the casualties on the other side were absolutely remarkable. Out of 60,000 Chinese, the Marines killed 40,000. Uh, and uh, of the 20,000 who were left, most of them were wounded. I mean, it was just such a remarkable, but it was a battle plan. And of course, when you think of, um, uh, when you think of um, war, I mean, if, we'd heard of, if you heard today that 40,000 people were killed in some other part of the world, you'd, so that's really very sad. Very, well, in war, it's, it's different. I mean, in other words, you say, if, if they don't get killed, we're going to get killed. But that, that's the way, uh, you know, the soldier idea of the thing. So uh, that, that's the way that it turned out. And it was just a remarkable breakout. But something happened in December. You had all the, the, the troops retreating. You had the, the, um, uh, this breakout I just mentioned. And that was that the leader of the 8th Army was killed in, in, in an accident in December. So they put in a man who was a very tough, very able soldier that you've all heard of, a general named Matthew Ridgway, and he, he took over. And so he, his idea was, and you can, you can have all different ways of using your troops, but his idea was, we just want to make it so difficult and so painful for the Chinese to continue this that, that we're going to gain some territory, go back to the, to the um, 38th parallel, and uh, then they'll go home. And that's exactly what he did. I mean, he, he, was, he, he had, he said, we don't, even if you don't get a lot of territory, it doesn't really matter. The main thing is you've got to kill a lot of Chinese. And that's really, and people said, well, that's kind of brutal to talk that way. He said, we have a killing group. All we do is kill. He said, this is war. We, we, have, to, we have to do it this way. So they had, uh, well, the Wanju, remember we said there was a, um, there was a, uh, where is this here? Right, right, right around here, there was a little Wanju bulge. There was a battle there, and there was 
There was another uh, battle, Chibnagi, Chibnagi, and, and they, uh, it, the losses were so were so great for, for the, uh, the the other side that they just uh, they had to go back. That's all. So eventually, as you can see, the um, and now we're getting ahead of ways, but it, in the end, as you see, it started out this way. And in 1953, there was a battle of Pork Chop Hill, and then it, it, it uh, that's that's the way it is today, and uh, that's ahead of the story because I want to go back to where Ridgeway's fighting. Remember, he's the commander. He replaced the, the, this um, army com army commander who, who was killed, but he didn't replace uh, MacArthur. MacArthur was still the one at the top, but. What he was doing and what the Joint Chiefs of Staff wanted and, and the Truman administration was what we all call limited war. You may remember going back to, to those times that there was that talk about limited war, die for a tie. I mean, don't, you know, we, that's not the way the Americans do it, that kind of thing. And there was a lot of agitation to go up to, um, to go back to the Yalu River. Now that things, we had things that were, uh, we had better successes under Ridgeway. Well, the one person, of course, who was the biggest proponent of that was, well, was Douglas MacArthur. And he's, he was the one, remember, no substitute for victory. We want to go all the way. And there's a certain appeal to that. I mean, if, if, if um, that had been won, for instance, back in 53, then maybe we wouldn't be having the, the, the um, trouble with North Korea the way we are today. But it, it's not that simple, because it, it could very well have turned into World War III back then. I mean, we're talking about uh, the Chinese and the Russians just not being able to tolerate the troops being that close to where they are. But uh, uh, MacArthur was insisting this had to happen. And that was really what, um, what was behind this famous thing that we all remember, the, the Truman-MacArthur uh, controversy, because um, MacArthur would talk to the press, and he wasn't supposed to. And he also wrote a letter to the, in um, the, the um, late winter uh, of um, 1951, uh, say, uh, to, to, to the uh, Joe Martin, the, the minority leader of, of, the, uh, of the House, and saying, you know, I, my hands are tied here. They're not letting us go all the way north here. And, and, he, and of course, MacArthur didn't like what Ridgeway was doing either because he, he, wanted, he wanted Ridgeway to, to uh, uh, adopt his plan and go all the way. But Ridgeway was following what Truman wanted, namely that you had to keep it a limited war and just go back to, to where it was before the invasion of the North Koreans. So finally it came to a, a showdown when uh, Joe Martin uh, made this public to the, to the, news, to, to the Congress and, and, and this letter that MacArthur had written that criticized the Commander-in-Chief. Uh, Truman said, that's it, and he talked to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and he was relieved. Well, I don't know if you remember that everyone knew there was going to be some kind of a, a, a problem when, when, when uh, uh, MacArthur was let go, but it was enormous. I mean, it was, no one ever had any idea that, that there would be this much anger on the part of the populace, and people were talking about, will he take over? Will he? I mean, it, and he, um, uh, he was let go, and they had a, this, this ticker tape parade in, in New York that was supposed to be one of the biggest ones we ever had, and then he made his, his joint, his, his uh, talk to Congress, uh, the, the joint session of Congress, and uh, did any of you watch that? I, mean, I remember as a kid, we watched it. I mean, it was on black and white TV, <laughs> we, we uh, saw it, and, and, and it, was, it was really, he, well, he, was a, he was a very masterful speaker. Uh, and so um, he, um, uh, I, I just remember the parts where it's, he said, this is what I said earlier, no substitute for victory. And also quoting that ballad about old soldiers never die, they just fade away. We all remember that one. And so he gave that talk and, of, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, there was a lot of cheering and all, but then they had hearings, they had congressional hearings about, about what MacArthur wanted to do. And the, and the congressional hearings is described in the book turned out very bad for MacArthur. I mean, he, he, it, didn't, it just wouldn't work. I mean, it, it was clear that that wasn't the way to go, to, to go all the way to the Yalu River. And so, um, in the end, uh, the, the Truman administration was vindicated, but it was a very unpopular war. As you know, that was one of the slogans when, when um, uh, there was the um, uh, campaign of um, uh, Eisenhower uh, against Stevenson, and, and you know, even though Stevenson was new, he still obviously had the Democratic mantle, and, and they were saying, well, it's, it's communism, it's Korea, it's corruption, and they were making all these charges, and, and uh, Korea was certainly a prominent one. So even though, in, in a way, Korea was, was uh, I mean, we, they maintained their integrity of that around the 38th parallel, it was a very unpopular war. 
And then, of course, when Eisenhower was running, remember he said, if elected, I'll go to Korea. And he did go to Korea. And they um, eventually had this famous battle you mentioned earlier about Port Chop Hill. And after that, there are actually several battles of Port Chop Hill that, that uh, they, they said, well, I mean, this, we're, we're going to, um, uh, it's just it's not worth it. Well, let's just, it's, they finally had an armistice. And there was one other, this is in July of 1953, and there was another reason why, and that was that Stalin had died. I think that might have had something to do with it in, um, in spring of 1953. So that maybe the, the, um, the communists felt they, they could uh, have some kind of an armistice. So that this story of the United States, I think, maintaining its integrity, it was a, it was a big cost, 54,000 uh, troops lost, uh, but there was an enormous cost. <laughs> But the, the idea of showing that when we had this agreement for having Korea divided this way, that we were, weren't going to let the uh, North Koreans get away with that aggression, and the fact that we preserved a country that's turned out to be uh, a very um, uh, you know, fine uh, uh, country, and, and also uh, uh, with Korea not, with, with uh, Japan not being worried about a communist Korea uh, uh, so close to their borders, and, and the fact that the, um, the, the uh, result was done without getting a, uh, into any kind of a larger war. That, that was a real achievement. And, and these, these, these items here, the results of the Korean War, are all just masterfully, um, masterfully told uh, by uh, Halberstam. Just, he weaves it all together, showing how, through all this, we finally came out with a result that, that was really to the credit of the United States. So I, I, commend, I commend the book to, to your reading. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. We have a few minutes for questions. So uh, if you're asking a question, we will pass one of these microphones to you so everybody can hear. <coughs> Yes, that's right. In other words, Korea was a colony of Japan from 1910 until the end of the war. Was that all of Korea? All of Korea. That's right. All of... When was that very That was that in, in 1945. The, in 1945, the victorious powers decided to, to, to uh, separate it just at the 38th parallel. It was, it was just an agreement that was reached. It was, it was not... They, they just, in other words, Russia would like to have had it all be communist. We would like to have had it all be, be free under Sigmund Rhee. Although that was Sigmund Rhee still was somewhat of a, still had to, had to go a ways to get its um, uh, democracy, but uh, it was the idea of, uh, of having one be more in the communist zone and the other being in the. Uh, that, would, that have, would you say it was a mistake? Why not leave the country as it was? Why separate half and half? I think that would, it would have been better, no question about it. But the, neither party wanted to give in, so they compromised. No, I I agree that that would have been better. Question here. Yeah. Well, David, I just want a very accurate description of what happened. Um, I was in there, over there, for a period of time. I lost my roommate from college at the Chosen Reservoir in December 1950. I wasn't up there then. Uh, the one thing that I did want to uh, mention or modify was that Korea was not a colony, Korea was ceded to. Japan at the end of the Russian-Japanese War. And so it really was occupied territory. And uh, Japanese occupied it for 40 years. But you might classify it as a colony, but it was really occupied land by Russia. Well, I, I don't think that I would disagree with that. I, David Halberstam does use the word colony, but I think that there are colonies and there are colonies, but it was one that was completely under the subjection of Japan during that period. One other point also. Um, and this was not really a surprise to the intelligence officers and personnel in, uh, in Japan in the spring of, eight, of 1950. Uh, my roommates were going back in after being in World War II. It was over there with the 1st Cavalry Division. It was intelligence officers at the time. He'd been sent into uh, Korea for some reconnaissance. I received, we received a letter from our civil college in April 1950, uh, two months before it broke out. 
and he wrote us a four-page letter. He said, it's only a question of time before the Chinese take the North Koreans by the hand and lead them over the 38th parallel. Intelligence officers knew a lot about this. Intelligence officers also told MacArthur, don't split your forces because there's a million Chinese waiting for you up there. And MacArthur was just able, never able to accept somebody else's decision. But really, if uh, our leaders sometimes pay, pay more attention to the professional intelligence that we have, we might have been better then and better now. Well, I think that's a good point. I think the other thing is that the intelligence officer of MacArthur was supposed to have been one who only gave MacArthur what he wanted to hear, a fellow named Charles Willoughby. I don't know if you heard about, about that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? I read the book a while ago, and I, but my recollection was that MacArthur was living in La La Land in Japan. He, wasn't gonna, he had no clue as to what was going on in Korea, or if he did have a clue, he wasn't accepting any of it. So that I think even though he had this victory at Incheon, um, that he, he was a terrible commander to, at that time, uh, in terms of what was going on in Korea, what he knew, what he didn't do, what he was, he was living the life he, he had lackeys who all, who all said yes, yes, yes. Nobody said no, no, no. And um, I, I just like to comment on that. Yeah, well, I think the first of all, David Halberstam would agree with you 100%. That's the first thing. I think the second thing, though, is that there was this mystique, as you said. He, he, this, um, when he, he did give this talk, and he had, a, he had a style, evidently, that he developed through the years that they gave uh, him a certain uh, aura when people came to visit and all. But he had a, um, did this, person we mentioned earlier is intelligence man, uh, Charles Willoughby, who just told him anything he wanted to hear about, about, about the, the presence of, of the uh, Chinese. He had this other Ned Almond who, yes. who also just pushed people uh, yes. to do things that just were, just out, that they were not even uh, feasible at all. And uh, he did have his own, it was almost like, a, speaking of the Asian mind, it was like a little Asian group where he was like the potentate at the top and he had all these, these people working around him. But, uh, this Inchon landing, that was really the thing. In fact, in, in some people said it was almost, it, it's, it was certainly a, a masterful stroke, but it was almost too bad that it happened in the sense that it gave him a mystique. And people said, because everyone thought it wasn't going to work, and it did work. And so they thought, well, he must know what he's doing. But he never stayed overnight in, in, in Korea. He was always over there in Tokyo, which is, is for, I mean, this is Japan, but Tokyo would be further up there. And. Um, uh, I, what you say is that there was, he, well, some people you blame it on different things. Some people said he was too old. I don't think 70 is that old. But I mean, you know, on the other hand, for uh, a general, I guess you'd certainly you'd like to have someone like O.P. Smith who's in his 50s or, or the other Walker in his 60s. But I think that um, uh, what you say about him, about uh, MacArthur not being at all understanding what was going on, and also this Ned Alvin who was telling his uh, first Green Division to, to go all the way up there very fast, was completely out of touch with reality. That, that's true. Sir, I, I, uh, when I read the book, I wanted to shoot on it. I just, uh, my God, for general to be that way. My war was Vietnam, and I was a, a terrible war. I was a surgeon in Vietnam. And I, I think we made so many mistakes. What I want to know from you is what your impression is of David Hammer's friends. Did he really, he went into platoons, he went into, uh, in, in, into the, the, again, the nitty gritty of the war itself. He knew every platoon. How did he do that? How did he know all this? I know he did Vietnam, he did, you know, many tools of surprise. But how's it got like that? Um, get so, involved and so knowledgeable about what the two in here, what what company with that. I mean, did he really do a lot? I mean, the guy was a wrong goal. Well, there, obviously with the two books, it would be completely different. Well, with the uh, book that I just uh, reviewed here, it was all with interviews, but he, he, has a, he did an enormous amount of interviewing. He was a very good interviewer uh, and did talk not only with, with people later, but also in Vietnam about, about Korea. In Korea itself, he was out there. I mean, I've seen pictures of him. You've probably seen in some of these books where he's, he's, he looks like a soldier. He's out there and did um, 
uh, not just to do it from, from uh, telephones or anything. He was right there where, where things were going on. And he had a real knack for that. I guess you'd call him somewhat of a swashbuckling type journalist. That he, in fact, he may have been one of the originators of that kind of journalism where he was with the troops and, and got uh, leads and, and got things that other people maybe weren't getting. But my understanding is that he was very accurate on the things he wrote about Vietnam, and that's probably why he got his Pulitzer Prize. Question right here. I think we have time for one more after right, this. Ah, <clears throat> since we're in a recession, it might be worth remembering that Douglas MacArthur made his name very early by commanding troops that attacked the Bonus Army and burned down their tents after World War I. Well, that's mentioned in the book because uh, David Halberstam goes into uh, great detail and uh, about that, uh, the life of MacArthur and also talks about the bonus marchers. And that was one where Eisenhower, as you probably know, it was, his, it was uh, MacArthur's aide. And, and Eisenhower said, why do you do that? I mean, you, know, you shouldn't be doing that. These are people, these are people that fought, risked their lives in the First World War. But there was, some, there was something about the mentality of, of um, MacArthur that it, it, he just uh, he said, well, he acted as though these people were the enemy, really, when they weren't. They, they were just trying to get their bonuses because they were in such dire straits. So that what he did was really a, an outrageous thing. He definitely shouldn't have done that. Uh, the, the, some of the blame, you know, people try to get into gene, uh, gene therapy or whatever. They say his father was like that, that his father, uh, although he was a hero during um, the Civil War, when he was in charge of the Philippines, that uh, they had to remove him because he was just not... He, he was just not behaving properly when they were having the Philippine War in the early part of the 20th century. So, that, um, you know, he, there were some things. There was one quote that I heard about MacArthur uh, where it, was, it seemed accurate, and that was that the best things you've ever heard about MacArthur are probably true, and the worst things you've heard about MacArthur are also probably true. The idea that he, he did some things that really were not right at all. I mean, he received an award during the First World War that that he really hadn't earned. He wasn't on the field, but, he'd, but he didn't speak up and saying he shouldn't really have gotten it. These other people should have gotten it. And he also, um, uh, during the Second World War, although he did some really great things, that there, were, there were some other uh, things that he was criticized for. But as it was said in the book, if he had somehow left the scene after the, the Inchon landing, that would have been the best for his reputation, because that was probably the most remarkable thing that ever happened uh, under his guidance. But then this other, and, and then going back to those bonus marches, yeah, he, he had done some things that he really uh, should be soundly criticized for. One last question here. What was the strategic importance of Korea, and uh, why, why did the United States actually enter the war? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And early on when we talked about that, there was really no dissent. It wasn't, and of course, there wouldn't have been any dissent in Congress because they didn't have a vote on it. But in terms of in the Joint Chiefs of Staff and, and any advisors, any journals, there really was not dissent about uh, going in and, and repelling this uh, invasion. And I think the reason why, and, it, it is, and it's, when you say what was the importance, I think first of all, I think it showed a certain amount of integrity in, in terms of if the U.S. made an agreement with another country that we were going to do a 38th parallel, and we just let people run, run over that without any opposition, it makes us look pretty weak. I think that was one thing that really maintained our integrity. Also, I think there was some feeling about Korea itself, that the South Korea, that we wanted to, to, to be good to them. But I think that the, the, um, there was another factor, and that was these were communists. Now, the communists had, had won in, in uh, China. That they had, they had, I mean, it was, and, and Chiang Kai-shek, as, as you know, I mean, it was way ahead early on, and he, and he had our support, and he was wiped off, and he, he was uh, uh, wiped off the mainland. And as I said earlier, McCarthyism was at a, at a, at a big high here. So Truman, they said, I don't, I don't think this is the way to express it, but his opposition that he lost China. Well, I think that the, the superior forces and, and, and the, the, the insufficiencies of, of Chiang Kai-shek's Kai army were what lost China. But they said that Truman lost China. But what if he also lost uh, Korea to the communists? I mean, that, that would have really been caught. I mean, you're not going to do anything when these, when these communists are coming down? and completely unprovoked attack. And so I think that our interests are really domestic in terms of how people would feel about it, but also strategic for the world, showing that if we have this agreement after the, the first, the Second World War with the other powers, why should we let someone just ride roughshod over it, that's all. Hey.